So now let's take a deeper dive into the central nervous system. Remember earlier we talked about central versus peripheral and we mentioned that the central nervous system was the brain and the spinal cord. However, given the fact that these are very sensitive, very important organs, they're gonna need some protection. So how do we protect our central way, our main way of controlling the rest of the body? Some are obvious, like bones. Think about the vertebra in your back, the bones of your skull, those are going to provide some good protection. Right? Think of your skull as like a built-in helmet. But it's not enough. We need some other modes of protection as well. The meninges are going to provide some protection by wrapping themselves around the central nervous system. These are protective membranes, and we have three of them. The pia mater, the dura mater, and the arachnoid mater are all going to provide that protection. And then to give us some more cushioning, we have cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. In the spaces between the meninges, in the ventricles of the brain, we find this fluid that can help cushion to protect the central nervous system. So while the bones act kind of like a helmet, the cerebral spinal fluid acts like an airbag to make sure that any sort of impact, any sort of shaking or movement doesn't rattle your brain around inside your skull. So we see some of them here. Here's the skin of the scalp, the periosteum that covers all of our bones, the actual bone of the skull, and then we have the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater, which is hugging the brain itself. When we look at the central nervous system, we can divide it down by tissue type as well. We have gray matter, and white matter. And we see this both in the brain and the spinal cord. The gray matter has the cell bodies and all of the non-myelinated fibers. So all of the areas that did not have that myelin sheath are going to be found in the gray matter. And this is where we process information. This is where we integrate all of the information we bring in. The white matter has the myelinated axons. So the myelin sheaths are part of the white matter. And their primary goal is to transmit, which if you think about it, it makes sense. The cell bodies would be the ones to do the processing. The white matter where we have all the axons are going to move that signal along a line. And so we see it here. We see the gray matter, it's actually gray, and the white matter is actually white. Now down here, when we look at a cross-section of the spinal cord, we don't see that because it's been stained, but we see the gray matter has been stained darker in this kind of darker pinkish purple color, in this butterfly-like shape. And then this more peachy pink is the white matter. Let's look at the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is going to extend from the base of your brain all the way down your vertebral canal. And this is going to allow for your brain to communicate with all of the other parts of your body, for the most part. So the communication with your arms, your legs, your abdominal cavity is all going to be due to the fact that you have a spinal cord bridging the gap between your brain and that body part. The spinal cord can also do a little bit of thinking for itself, so to speak, and that it's the center for your reflex arcs. A reflex arc is an involuntary movement or change in posture or something along those lines, some sort of change that's enacted in response to some sort of stimulus. And it's because you have to react quickly without thinking about it. So for example, when you touch a hot stove, you don't have to touch the stove and think about how hot it is before you pull your hand away. As soon as you feel the heat, your instinct pulls your hand back. And then you think about how your hand hurts and how hot it was. Let's look at the spinal cord. So again, we already pointed out the gray matter versus white matter. Again, this one's been kind of colorized a little bit. The gray matter is this butterfly shape in the middle and the white matter is surrounding it. If we look at it and how it communicates with the peripheral nervous system, we see that there are these ganglions and there's nerve roots they're going to reach out and kind of communicate with our spinal cord. These are going to be what become the spinal nerves part of the peripheral nervous system. So those spinal nerves are going to communicate 
with your arms, your legs, your heart, your diaphragm, wherever. Right? And bring that information to the spinal cord. Now, the brain has the meninges, but so does the spinal cord. And so we see those here, too. We see those layers providing some covering and protection. Providing some covering and protection. But the spinal cord is not the most interesting part of all this. The most interesting part of the central nervous system is the brain. And we can break the brain down into four major parts. The cerebrum, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Let's dive into each one. Let's look at the cerebrum first. The cerebrum is probably what you think of first when you think of the brain. The wrinkled bits that are kind of all twisting in different directions. The thinky bits that, that I like to call them. This is the largest portion of the brain and this is where your lobes are found. And there's four lobes that we're gonna discuss. The frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, in the occipital lobe. Now, if you remember the skeletal system, these names probably sound a little familiar. Frontal lobe sounds like frontal bone. Temporal lobe sounds like temporal bone, and so on and so forth. So where would you think you would find each of these lobes? Well, they're gonna be hiding behind those exact bones. So the frontal bone, if you remember, is forming your forehead. The frontal lobe will be found at the front of the brain. The frontal lobe is where your conscious thought sits, as well as your primary motor area, so your ability to control voluntary movements. The temporal lobe is going to deal with sound, smell, and speech. The parietal lobe will deal with taste, as well as somatosensory. Somatosensory would be the sensory information that comes from your skin and your muscles. And then the occipital lobe will deal with your visual information. And so we can see them divided up. Here is the frontal lobe. Then we see motor areas. Right? We do see a little bit for some speech, kind of off to the side here. The temporal lobe down here dealing with auditory, some speech as well. The parietal dealing with taste and somatosensory. And then the occipital dealing with visual. Now I do want to point out this interesting piece here called the central sulcus. And the reason I want to point it out is because it shows how things are organized in the brain. So the central sulcus is dividing the frontal and the parietal lobes. Remember that the frontal lobe handles motor control and the parietal lobe handles sensory information. And what we see is that the area of the brain that handles motor control of the tongue is right next door to the part of the brain that handles the sensory information coming from the tongue. And we see that pattern happen down the central sulcus. So the, vol the motor area that handles the arm is right here. And just over here, we see the somatosensory area for that arm. Same thing with the leg. Voluntary control of the leg up here, sensory information for that leg right here. It shows how things are organized so that we don't necessarily have signals bouncing all over the place with no sort of organization at all. If we look at the cerebral cortex, there's a few particular areas that we want to look at. And again, cortex, we want to think the outer layer. So this is where the gray matter is at. We have a few terms we want to define before going any further. We have the primary motor area, which is found in that frontal cortex. Uh, or the frontal lobe, and that's where you have the voluntary control of your skeletal muscles. The primary somatosensory area found on the parietal lobe for the sensory information coming from your muscles and skin. Association areas are where we integrate information together. And then processing centers are for higher level functions, so something like speech. We'll look a little bit deeper into speech in a little bit. Here's that central sulcus again, like I mentioned, showing that primary motor areas organization and the somatosensory areas organization. And we see how that lines up so nice and neat. It's kind of amazing if you think about it. Let's move on to the next part, the diencephalon. 
The diencephalon has really two main pieces, although we'll throw the, pine uh, the pineal gland in there as well. But the two main pieces of the diencephalon are the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Now these are pieces that are found a little bit further into the brain. And the hypothalamus is going to kind of control some of the primitive things in your body. So maintaining homeostasis. Do you feel hungry? Are you sleepy? Do you feel thirsty? Is your body temperature hot or cold? How's your water balance? And the hypothalamus is going to bridge us to the endocrine system. We'll get deeper into the hypothalamus later. The thalamus is going to kind of serve as like a bridge in a way, serve as a gateway. So it has gray matter that's going to take all the sensory input except for smell and is going to help send the signals to the right area. It's also involved in memory and emotions. And then the pineal gland, this is going to be what helps maintain your wake and sleepiness. So in order to make you sleepy when it's dark out, the pineal gland will secrete melatonin that'll make you tired. And if you don't have any melatonin being secreted, you feel alert and awake. We'll talk more about the pineal gland again in the endocrine system. So let's look at the diencephalon now. So here is the diencephalon. It's found kind of hiding with the third ventricle. Pineal glands back here. We have the thalamus, which is going to surround our third ventricle, which is going to be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And then the hypothalamus is extending down. Just below that is going to be the pituitary gland. We're not going to talk much about that now, but we want to kind of keep it in mind. Moving on to the third part, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is going to take the sensory information we receive and integrate it together so that we know how we're kind of formed, how we're standing, what's our current position. So the cerebellum is going to kind of help you maintain balance, posture, make sure that you are able to coordinate movements together so that you're not tipping all over the place. So it's going to help us stay upright and maintain our posture. All the tiny little adjustments that you have to make to make sure that you're sitting upright or standing upright. It's going to coordinate voluntary movement. So your ability to put one foot in front of the other while you walk or talk at the same time is due to your cerebellum. And it also is involved with your muscle memory, so to speak. Your ability to learn and remember new motor skills. So when you learn how to hit a baseball, right, you don't have to relearn that motion all the time. You can learn how to coordinate those movements together and store that information away for later. The last piece of the brain is the brainstem. The brainstem handles a lot of the kind of rudimentary, kind of very basic functions of your brain. And it includes three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. The midbrain is going to help communicate with the cerebrum and the spinal cord and the cerebellum. It's also where we have reflexes. The pons is another bridge between the cerebellum and the central nervous system. It'll help regulate your breathing, and it's also the reflex center for all the movements of your head. And then the medulla oblongata is going to be the reflex centers to make sure that you breathe, make sure your heart beats, and that your blood pressure isn't wildly fluctuating or going out of whack. Throughout this, we see the reticular formation. The reticular formation is a component of your reticular activating system. This is what regulates alertness. So let's look at it here. Here's that reticular formation. That reticular formation is what's maintaining alertness. Now, it's not the same as the pineal gland. We're not talking about are you awake or are you asleep. We're talking about are you aware of anything happening around you. So if you had damage to the reticular formation, you'd be thinking more along the lines of a coma rather than being tired. Think about it. If you're asleep and your fire alarm, like your smoke alarm goes off, are you just knocked out, unaware that it happens? No. You jerk awake and you recognize the sound and you get out of your house. But if someone had damage to a reticular formation and that smoke alarm was going off, they probably wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't be aware that something dangerous was happening. 